So I just literally recorded this whole video and realized later that my memory card was full so the sound wasn't capturing. So we go again. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jake and welcome to Hot Pod, episode two, The Rogue Prince. Just two episodes in and this show already continues to build up from previous episodes. And with that, as I was expecting, we have an intro sequence, which of course has the same music of Thrones, which hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I am honestly a little bit disappointed that we didn't get an original score. Even if it wasn't like a brand new one, the Targaryen theme, for example, from Game of Thrones was mad. That one could have been used maybe. But honestly, this isn't a deal breaker for me. I still think this intro is good. In fact, I don't think I'll ever be skipping it. We have a wonderful 3D scene of blood pouring through Viserys' model of old Valyria, embodying one part of the Targaryen words, fire and blood. This is actually also a family tree depicting the Targaryen bloodline, depicting events from the doom of Valyria to Aegon's conquest, there's Anus in it, Jaehaerys, Alysanne, and other things I'm sure you could point out. It's a whole breakdown actually, a whole story within a story which I don't feel like getting into. But it's worth paying attention to if you're a hardcore fan just to see if you can point out who features where. But getting into the episode, we open on a gruesome scene of the crab feeder living up to his name, feeding crabs. We're getting time jumps here as we establish that it's been six months since the death of Emma, six months since Rhaenyra was chosen as heir. And we still see her performing the same duties of the king's cupbearer. Although it seems like nothing has changed despite her being heir now. She's still quite blatantly disregarded by the men of the council. So even though she's learning the political nitty gritty stuff, this does not mean she has a voice at the council. Kragas Draha, also known as the Crab Feeder, is proving to be a real thorn in Corlys Valerian's butt. His antics in the Stepstones are seriously damaging the famous Valerian navy. Although they aren't really as pressed as he is, Viserys is reluctant to start a war with the Triarchy, the leadership of the Free Cities. Rhaenyra in true Targaryen fashion suggests that dragon riders deal with it, because what use is a dragon if you're just going to use a match to start a fire? You know what I mean? Of course the men just brush her aside until it finds something better to do. This is what men do! Yeah. This is men stuff! Yeah. 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 Men stuff! Yeah. Yeah. Stop. Which gives her the responsibility of choosing the newest member of the King's Guard. Of course, Rhaenyra chooses Sir Kristen Cole, and we see how interested she is in him. This is really just setting up Kristen Cole for what he becomes later on. So right now he's a member of the King's Guard, and he later becomes known as the Kingmaker for reasons that will become apparent. I love the interaction between Rhaenyra and Rhaenys. It's such a powerful moment here because we see how alike these two characters are and how unlike each other they are as well. The acting here is full of the bone good. The conversation reminding you that the order of things here is wild and that Westerosi misogyny is not to be trifled with. Some powers of the world see King Viserys and the Iron Throne as weak right now, hence the crab feeder being so bold. Corlys uses this information, playing his pieces in the Game of Thrones by suggesting that Viserys remarry. Suggesting his own daughter Lena, of course. Now on paper, this is the perfect match. Both Targaryen and Valarion being ancient Valyrian houses, Valyrians being the most powerful house in the realm, second only to the Tarks. But admittedly, the match is a little bit creepy. And no doubt, Viserys fears bringing down the wrath of one Chris of House Hansen. <laughs> I'm Chris Hansen, and this is an investigation called Hansen versus Predator. The look on Viserys' face says it all. She is only 12 years old after all. He of course later chooses a 15 year old, so not much of an improvement there, my guy. Now, sidebar, I did notice in the show they said one of the two great Valerian houses, which isn't exactly true. They are the two most powerful houses from Valeria, but not the only ones. House Celtigar, or Celtigar, which hasn't been mentioned in the show, is actually also a house of Valerian descent. The patriarch of the house of Lord Crispin Celtigar actually served as Aegon I's master of coin after the conquest. And during the dance, a Lord Bartimos Celtigar serves on the Black Council as Rhaenyra's master of coin. Viserys has an infected ass finger. And what did we say in the last episode? You get cut, you get fucked. He is down bad and this is clearly an ill portent of what's to come. The title of this episode is The Rogue Prince, which is actually the name of one of the short stories which makes up Fire and Blood. I feel like we mention a new George Martin book in every video, which just goes to show how much content and world building he has created for this universe. I've always said he could easily create like eight, nine, ten different film and TV adaptations just from this world alone. It's incredible. Anyway, The Rogue Prince in question is of course my guy, Dame. 
Damon. Damon in the last episode was told to go back home to his wife in Runestone, to which he said, nah. So instead, Damon has been occupying Dragonstone since then, without permission. He has also stolen a dragon egg, one of Dreamfire's no less, and with that, we have another dragon name drop. Dreamfire is a she-dragon who was previously bonded to one Reynar Targaryen and is currently riderless. She later becomes the mount of Helena Targaryen, the daughter of Viserys and Alicent. I will get gassed every time a new dragon is mentioned because we have so many more dragons to see guys. Not only has Daemon stolen a dragon egg, but he's also announced that like the old Targaryens, he will be taking a second wife. One that he actually likes. In Missaria, his paramour. Also stating that she is pregnant with his child, which is who the dragon egg was intended for. This egg being the very same egg that Rhaenyra had put aside for her brother, the heir for a day, Balon. Daemon also calls himself the rightful heir to the Iron Throne, which pisses his brother off to no end. <laughs> Viserys of course wants to go and put Daemon in his place, but Otto as Hand of the King suggests that he should be the one to go and deal with Daemon. What follows is a very intense standoff with Daemon and his gold cloaks when Otto arrives on Dragonstone. Steel is drawn and it comes very close to heads flying, and shall I say rather efficient tans sponsored by Caraxes himself, until Rhaenyra joins the fray on Cyrax. See how Daemon evidently cares for her because he's unwilling to oppose or kill his beloved niece. Later it's revealed that Damon just lied about the wedding and the pregnancy for reasons that are as yet unclear. But details though, notice how Rhaenyra is hellbent on proving that she has what it takes to rule. Taking these big decisions into her own hands and acting. And it kind of changes the tone for what kind of character she is. The difference in how she would be as a ruler compared to a father who is considered weak and indecisive. Almost setting herself apart from the king as if to say, look, all oh, that leadership rah-rah business, I got this. And I'ma fly this hole. Great foreshadowing here as you see dragon pitted against dragon, even though we know it doesn't come to anything in this situation. But notice the importance of having a dragon on your side. Otto stands down because Caraxes gets involved and it takes Rhaenyra on Cyrax to even the playing field. So having capable dragon riders is absolutely crucial as we will see with the dragon seeds later on. And let me just say, Carax has got that neck, throat goat for real. Also notice that Damon's connection with Runera is more important to him than whatever point he's trying to make. Back to the homeboy Viserys taking a stroll with the Lady Lena Valerion. First dates can be so uncomfortable, right? This is a match he clearly isn't too fond of. I love that she asks about Valerian and Vega. Although she's asking about dragons when she looks like she should be watching goddamn Dragon Tales. Fun fact, this sweet little girl goes on and claims the oldest, most ferocious dragon, Vega, which explains her interest in the whereabouts of the great beast. I cannot wait to see Vega. She gives Viserys the spiel from Corlys himself, making him very uncomfortable of course and asking her what her mother thinks, to which Lena says, she told me I wouldn't have to bed you until I turned 14. Yikes. This is the most Cersei Lannister sounding thing I have ever heard. Moving on, this episode is super political in nature. Otto Hightower is steady pulling strings behind closed doors, deliberately pushing his daughter to gain favor with the king, who of course starts to see Alicent as a viable candidate for his wife. And politically, in terms of a match, the Hightowers are among the better options. House Hightower is actually the oldest house in Westeros and one of the most powerful and richest. Otto Hightower, of course, being Hand of the King, is another other advantage. The match would be a very strong political statement to the realm as well. I can't help but like Alison's character too, she's such a polite lady, so so likeable. Which of course you can't also help but feel suspicious towards. Viserys and Alison talk about Old Valeria, which as a book fan is just ugh. George Martin hasn't mentioned details of the design of Valeria in his books. And here we see an amazing miniature model of Old Valeria and Seven Hells is it beautiful. He mentions the Anagrion and the Blood Mages and how a thousand dragons flew over the ancient Freehold at the height of its power. All just good bits of lore for the hardcore fan. Some of it being new even if you've read the books. They look as brilliant as the Valerians wore. These men built a city inside an active volcano. Come on. Viserys calls the council later to make an announcement. He's about to choose his wife and Corlys is like, <laughs> let's get it. But Viserys has clearly grown fond of Alicent and he chooses her instead, which is a major 
curveball to Corliss who takes serious offense. Otto is just gassed because it's his turn now to be like, we up. Renera as well is vexed. Her dad is trying to marry her best friend after all, which also opens up the possibility of male heirs coming and contending her claim to the throne. And I'm sure it also feels like betrayal because she realizes that Alicent may have been secretly putting the moves on her dad. Coral is feeling like an absolute chump after being repeatedly snubbed by the king, reaches out to the one man who would understand his wrath more than anyone else, the king's brother Damon. He's like, look man, I'm a second son, you're a second son. Let's make this official. He mentions how the worth is not given, but one that should be made. And so gets him on board with his plan to bring justice to the stepstones. Corliss appeals to Damon's ego, thus making an unlikely partnership between two of the most powerful men in the realm. A relationship which continues well into the dance. Now, two episodes in and it just blows my mind how much more we have to see, how much more we have to feel. The dance itself hasn't even started. All of this is just preamble. Just the amount of events that happens during the war is seasons worth of television. And the way they're building this up is brilliant. The time jumps are really working for me too because you're getting all of this necessary information without it feeling rushed. I also just before recording this video watched the preview to episode 3 which will probably feature an even bigger time jump. Because the dance in the books only actually kicks off about 20 years I think after Viserys and Alicent get married which is of course when Viserys dies. The events of this episode are so important because of the choices that these characters make. Choices which eventually lead to a more spread out domino effect later on. Viserys' choice of a wife, Rhaenyra's choice of Kristen Cole to the Kingsguard, Daemon choosing Rhaenyra etc etc. The costumes too man and the details in them definitely Emmy award worthy. So rating this I'm probably going to give us a solid 8 out of 10. Admittedly not the most exciting episode in terms of nail-biting suspense or action, but I love me some good political intrigue and this had plenty. So yeah, there we have it. On to the next episode. I will see y'all next week. Peace.